So I would like to welcome everyone to um, Grand Rounds for our Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. I know you hear this term, uh, this kind of phrase often that I'm privileged to introduce today our speaker, but I really, really <laughs> am privileged to have uh, Dr. Mishinshi here to speak to us today. In terms of a little bit of his uh, professional history, he did his undergraduate and PhD work at the University of Michigan, then completed a pediatric residency at John Hopkins and did a fellowship in Hemonc at Fred Hutchinson Cancer, what was at the time Cancer Research Center, but now I understand is Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center um, and the University of Washington, Seattle. So unfortunately, he kind of went from East Coast to West Coast and kind of skipped over the Midwest where we had Perhaps we would have been very lucky to have you land here. Um, once in um, Washington, he did a very quick rise on faculty um, at the University of Washington in P.T. Monk and at Fred, Fred Hutch. He rose to uh, quickly from research associate to full professor. And he has very strong research uh, program as well as uh, a significant clinical load. He really, when I look at Dr. Mishinchi, he really is the consummate physician scientist. And a major piece of that is actually the mentoring and teaching that he's done. He has mentored over 30 pre-doc and post-doc students, and he's mentored more than a dozen junior faculty, all of whom now are at academic institutions, most of whom are actually also in the role of physician scientist. So what a tremendous tribute to you, uh, Dr. Mishinchi. He serves on the scientific advisory committees of national and international organizations focused on hematology oncology. And most of his efforts in research have been devoted and clinical have been devoted to pediatric myeloid disorders, although not exclusively to that. Um, he has been extremely prolific and productive with over 200 publications. He's identified really important molecular immunophenotypic biomarkers. And importantly, his research is also focused on understanding the mechanisms that underlie the reason that those biomarkers are of prognostic significance. And then on the subsequent step of identifying therapies for targeted therapy in, this, uh, in these disorders. I know that all of us get asked about barriers that we might encounter in our clinical or our research work and how they're affecting us. My personal observations of Dr. Mishinchi is that he doesn't see them as barriers. He sees them, but he sees them more as hurdles. And then he finds a way to either sprint over them by creating some very new innovative approach, usually some form of collaborative group that's focused on research, or sometimes when there's a lot of these uh, kind of uh, so-called barriers, they he kind of finds a way to weave in between them. But he's always looking forward and his compass is really patient care. And so it is really a great pleasure to have you here, Dr. Mashinki, to talk about your work. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, and that is uh, certainly the uh, kindest and most generous uh, introduction I've had. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, it's uh, really um, my uh, privilege to be here to uh, present to you and um, one of the things that um, we've been uh, working on is um, really how to uh, really think about AML uh, um, um, in a, a little bit different way. Uh, I think that AML uh, has suffered uh, from uh, a significant stagnation in, in therapy and even some of the uh, innovative uh, uh, approaches, including sequencing, uh, has really not yielded uh, much. So what I'm going to do is uh, provide a little bit of uh, um, sort of a background on uh, where uh, uh, we have been and uh, also where we're going and how um, 
um, uh, we just need to sort of uh, change some of our uh, approach and thinking. Uh, and we don't, uh, um, instead of looking for a single drug that's going to cure uh, AML in its entirety, to perhaps uh, look at it as it is uh, a really a, a compilation of a different molecular subset that may need different uh, 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 therapeutic approaches. Um, um, one thing that, um, uh, uh, let's see, um, I want to start with, uh, I have really, uh, my role has gone from uh, uh, being in the lab and, um, uh, you know, pipetting from one tube to the next to becoming more of a, a conductor, uh, trying to really bring uh, uh, folks and resources together. And um, a couple of people I want to make sure that I mention, uh, as they've been incredibly inst instrumental uh, for where we are, is Bob RCC and Daniela Gerhard. Bob is a close friend and a colleague who uh, really, st we started thinking about uh, sort of a genomics of pediatric AML at the time that uh, uh, NCI was putting uh, resources into uh, the TCG AML work. And Daniela became uh, a champion for that uh, effort, trying to really um, bring resources for uh, childhood AML studies uh, um, as uh, all the efforts uh, were put on, uh, you know, on the adult side. And then really um, the number of folks who have contributed is just enormous, as you can see, and all the uh, both funding resources, but the personal uh, contributions people have had has been enormous. So I always want to make sure that I put this slide uh, first to um, um, in, in case I run out of time. So anyway, um, so when you look at our uh, outcomes for childhood AML, we sort of put, pat ourselves on the back, oh, look where we've come. But in reality, we haven't really done that much in the last uh, you know, two to three decades. And actually, if you look at our outcome, our most uh, recent, this is AML 1031, it really falls below where we were uh, a decade before that. So not only we've stagnated in improving outcomes, uh, but it seems like we're sort of slipping back because we're sort of trying to do the same old, same old. And as uh, um, someone said, uh, uh, the definition of insanity, we just keep repeating the same thing, hoping for a different uh, result. And if you really want to see the definition of insanity is this is the slide that I always present. This is our um, outcome from the last three phase three trials that the COG has, Children's Oncology Group has done. And what you're seeing is that these are absolutely overlapping survival curves. In the last three trials that we put nearly 1,500 patients into each trial and randomizing them uh, into uh, standard of care versus standard of care plus some uh, targeted therapy. And uh, what we're seeing is that in all of these studies, we have not been able to gain, have any gains of any sort, because this is all we're delivering, even though we're delivering our targeted agents in a non-targeted fashion, giving it to everyone. And uh, this slide shows that if we simply deliver the drug in uh, patients uh, um, with exp who express a target, this is the Milotark, a CD33 targeted uh, ADC. And what we're seeing is that if we simply, uh, uh, this is our um, the middle uh, um, uh, slide, if we simply uh, look at the outcome based on uh, 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 if the drug is given to patients with uh, CD33 expression versus not, you really see the difference is substantial. And then this is in, specifically in KMT2A rearranged or MLL AML, that this really the relapse rate drops substantially. So uh, we really need to really step back from our approach to uh, uh, a single drug trying to hit uh, you know, all uh, diseases and trying to basically find one drug that cured the AML and really think about a little bit more uh, 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 programmatically and more uh, precisely. And this is uh, this really shows that if we approach uh, therapy in a really good, delivering uh, in a targeted fashion, what we can do. These are this is the outcome for patients with uh, six nine translocation, uh, uh, not to fourteen deck. And uh, uh, the survival curve that you're seeing in in red, this is our uh, six nine translocation patients. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, this is the outcome from, uh, you know, a, a trial that went from 1988 to 2002. This is in two trials. 
and the outcome is quite dismal. Um, what we've done is that uh, we identified uh, the fact that majority of these patients with FLA3 ITD positive. And just simply by uh, treating patients uh, uh, with uh, uh, based on ITD um, uh, and taking the transplant, this is just simply taking patient transplant, our outcome improves dramatically. Uh, and then most recent trial, the 6-9 patients who received serafinib, and this is not even just like looking at the 6-9 by themselves, but receiving serafinib, taking the transplant, all of a sudden our out of survival is 93%, one to 15% to 93%. The small number of patients, not huge, but if we focus on uh, uh, specific targets, this is what the potential for AML is. So this is just an example of uh, how by uh, really going after a, a target, we can really change uh, outcome for AML dramatically. So, um, TCGA uh, uh, put funds into uh, uh, sequencing. Theoretically, they say 200, but in reality, uh, they tossed in a whole bunch of APLs and some CMLs to meet that 200. And so it's more like 150 something. And uh, some of them, they got whole exome sequencing. Some of 50 of them got whole genome sequencing. Uh, RNA sequencing was like 160 something. But the bottom line is that in, in, and, and most of them were older adults. And when we initially approached them, this is Bob and I uh, uh, re reached out multiple times uh, to uh, NCI. They basically said that the TCG AML, you know, data will just inform therapies in all ages, kids and adults. And this is, you know, um, uh, one of the folks at NCI leadership who told us this. And uh, and as you can see, the outcome that you're seeing, the uh, plot that you're seeing on the left they, we really, besides the DNMT3A that has uh, virtually no relevance in uh, younger patient, by younger I mean uh, less than 50 years of age really, and IDH1 and 2, there really, there weren't any meaningful number of uh, 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 mutations that were useful. Uh, and then, so this is IDH1, IDH2, and DNMT3, as you can see in our younger patients, like pediatric patients, less than 21, there's basically, we don't see any IDH1 uh, and DNMT3A, very, very few IDH2s. And, you know, we had actually a company come and uh, pitch uh, using uh, IDH inhibitors in pediatric AML. And um, as Betsy knows, uh, we have a, a trial in pediatric with IDH inhibitors that's been open for four years and not a single patient has accrued because there are no patients with this uh, mutation to, uh, um, you know, to who needs the drug. So as you can see, some of these mutations that's being identified in older patients is irrelevant, not just pediatrics, but even in, uh, you know, those less than uh, 40 years of age. So um, uh, really the idea of uh, uh, generating data in younger patients. So this is where uh, we were finally able to, uh, I get the resources for sequencing. Initially, uh, we had about 250 uh, patients that we sequenced uh, and really sh we showed that there was a difference uh, in genomic makeup uh, from the transcriptome to, uh, uh, to genome. And we actually expanded that uh, substantially. Uh, and now we have uh, genomic data from over 3,000 patients that uh, we have RNA-seq uh, whole genome that's we're completing. We'll have about 1,400 whole genomes, uh, microRNA methylation data that we're uh, interrogating right now. Uh, we're generating long read RNA sequencing with PacBio, and we're starting our proteome work. So this is, and all of this uh, uh, is being deposited in public domain. So it's going to be available uh, for uh, uh, for use. And uh, so uh, just to sort of a quick uh, uh, view of overall from the um, DNA a variant standpoint, uh, pediatric AML is uh, perhaps right next to the raptoid tumors, uh, one of the, uh, 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 has least number of mutations. Uh, so this is our, uh, this is the TCGA. Uh, the red one is the TCGA uh, AML data and blues are pediatric AML data that the number of variants really ranges from no mutations at all to about uh, 40 or 50. And, um, and there are some mutations that are more common in kids than there are adults, as, uh, as we talked about, the DNMT3 and IDHs are more common in uh, uh, adults and older adults. And there are some that uh, uh, RAS mutations, WT1s, pt 10 11s these are more common in uh, our younger uh, patients. 
But one thing that's actually um, quite striking is the fact that uh, uh, SNVs uh, are certainly uh, far more common in older patients. Actually, the older you get, the more of those you accumulate, which is not uh, terribly surprising. And it's actually about the, the structural events that predominate in younger patients, especially in infants, that almost every a single one of the infants uh, uh, less than two years of age has some sort of a structural variance. You know, some of them are cryptic, uh, uh, some of them uh, not so much. So uh, overall, there seems to be a really cross, a crisscross of uh, variance, uh, structural variance uh, decrease by age and sequence variance increase. And this is something that the question of how do we use some of these and uh, we have sub substantial overlaps and such. But some of the cryptic fusions that we're picking up uh, end up being quite important, uh, uh, both from prognostic standpoint, but also providing um, a mechanism for us to go after in, uh, uh, in a meaningful uh, uh, clinical uh, manner. So this simply shows that uh, the incidence rate for AML in blue and MDS in uh, um, uh, orange. And basically what this really shows I, I like, is, is, the, is the fact that in older adults, it's impossible to really distinguish what is uh, uh, AML that is uh, um, driven from a preceding MDS and that is, uh, and what is a de novo AML. In fact, I argue that there's no such thing as de novo AML in those older than 60, 70, or 80, as because just because you didn't have the prior diagnosis doesn't mean that you did not have uh, uh, MDS. Um, so I think that this is where the clonal hematopoiesis comes in. And as uh, uh, we are uh, seeing that uh, uh, clone, uh, some of these variants are simply uh, uh, predicting uh, uh, evolution to AML. Uh, and if you do a, uh, do a marrow when you pick up some of these, there is a significant number of them. They actually have dysplasia that you can demonstrate. But the bottom line is uh, that uh, um, infants, uh, these are uh, unique uh, genotype that is driven by uh, uh, fusions, rather potent uh, fusions. And those that are older that are secondary to uh, MDS uh, uh, from accumulation of uh, genotoxic insults. And intermediate, uh, uh, and um, I argue somewhere between five and 40, 50, these are the, where the, the truly de novo uh, um, uh, AML uh, 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 lives. And this is where uh, the disease biology is actually quite uh, similar. And this whole idea of 1821 defining pediatric versus adult is somewhat arbitrary. I, someone, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about this and someone says, well, yeah, the, um, legal dr drinking age should not define disease biology. And that's exactly, uh, you know, how I feel that uh, um, we cannot say, oh, this is uh, 18 uh, versus 21. So disease is different and treatment should be different. So the question is that how do we use some of this data that we're generating? So I'm going to go through some of the uh, risk identification and some of the um, of, um, mark biomarkers that we've used for risk classification. Uh, we've uh, uh, this is a work that uh, Betsy and I have been working on for a long time, trying to optimize risk classification uh, in our COG trials. And uh, the CBFA 2T3 GLIST2, or I'll be calling CBF GLIST, this is one that, you know, uh, it's um, uh, uniquely seen in infants. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we, we don't really see it past um, uh, age uh, five, hardly any. There's maybe one or two that these are older patients that... Uh, for some reason, uh, but major overwhelming majority are less than two years of age. Uh, in the NOP KDM 5A, NOP 98 KDM 5A, the, you know, the, uh, the peak incidence is a little bit older, but again, as you can see, it goes up uh, and uh, peaks out about uh, age three to five and then goes back down. And basically uh, there's no uh, uh, adult counterparts. So we don't really, uh, we haven't not seen uh, any in adults, we've, we've sequenced a whole bunch of patients uh, from SWOT studies and not a single one we've seen. And then there's not 98 NSD1. Uh, these are older, they're, uh, uh, they're usually teenagers that uh, have this uh, fusion and uh, uh, uniquely associated with FLIP3 ITD. So you can see that there is a cryptic fusion that are not amenable to uh, uh, easy identification by uh, conventional karyotyping, that uh, sequencing, and uh, uh, Betsy has certainly done a remarkable job uh, generating uh, fish probes to really define some of these, and that's been uh, uh, highly valuable. 
And just quickly go over them, uh, the CBF glyphs probably all are by far the most uh, uh, refractory group of uh, patients. And uh, and this 10% survival is rather generous. Uh, uh, we see similar high risk uh, with NOP98 fusions of various uh, partners, uh, whether it's NOP uh, NSD1, uh, uh, KDM5, or other partners, uh, uh, they all seem to have uh, rather poor uh, survival. And this is uh, our risk classification that uh, uh, really Betsy and Gordana and uh, uh, you know, folks at the COG 1831 have put together, as you can see, it seems rather complex and convoluted, but really uh, this is uh, sits on uh, you know decades of history and uh, uh, um, uh, with karyotype and then some of the new uh, data from uh, uh, sequencing some of the cryptic fusions that are incorporated. Uh, and uh, what uh, where we are right now, uh, our uh, conventional uh, cytomolecular uh, uh, risk classification, we're able to uh, really assign uh, um, about forty, uh, uh, about thirty percent to our uh, high risk arm, and then we still have about uh, uh, 30, uh, 40 percent in standard risk that's allocated by uh, flow uh, MRD, and uh, by incorporating flow, uh, we've actually. Uh, uh, we're optimizing uh, our high risk uh, group. And uh, so this is a risk classification that's currently used in 1831. And we're trying to actually, um, uh, for our next trial, we're uh, digging through uh, uh, our uh, both historic data and the uh, newer data. And so uh, this is uh, um, all the fusions that involve NOP98. You can see different partners and outcomes uh, that uh, we're trying to, uh, and this has already been incorporated in 1831. Uh, the ETS family transcription factor, uh, uh, FOSS ERG uh, has already uh, been incorporated, but as you can see, there are quite a number of uh, ETS family transcription factors that uh, we would be able to uh, bring into uh, uh, the uh, risk uh, classification. And uh, when we look at the transcriptome level in the middle uh, uh, slide, you really see that although that uh, the fusion partners and even the genes uh, in the uh, different ETS family, uh, they are quite uh, uh, diverse. The transcriptome um, uh, is uh, quite similar regardless of uh, what the fusion uh, uh, is, as long as they're in the ETS family transcription factor. And also their outcome is very similarly. So we're able to go from a single uh, fusion to a family uh, of uh, transcription factor that uh, um, uh, alterations uh, uh, can have uh, uh, prognostic significance. Uh, one of the things that this is uh, work that Ben Wong just recently published, even simple, uh, uh, well, even well-known fusions in version 16, uh, based on where that uh, fusion junction is between uh, CBF beta and MYH11, that carries prognostic uh, significant and functional biology. That uh, uh, where uh, uh, the common uh, uh, fusion is between exon 5 and ex of uh, CBF beta and exon 33 of MIH11, and the variant uh, fusion junction carries a substantial clinical significance. And this is something that actually uh, has been corroborated in adult data as well. So this is a real finding. And uh, the question is how best to we, we are planning on uh, uh, in, uh, moving this forward, and there's actually overlap uh, with kit mutations that uh, really creates a, a potential for really significant uh, and quite interesting uh, biology that uh, uh, why is it that these uh, uh, junction variants uh, are so highly associated uh, with the acquisition of uh, kit mutation. And these are some of the other ones I um, refer to my Lambel risk classification. Uh, uh, Adam Lambel is really uh, collating all of uh, these uh, newer um, uh, prognostic markers, validating them and uh, uh, other um, risk, uh, you know, other uh, 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 subsets and trying to sort of really optimize our risk classification for the next clinical uh, uh, trial. And that's one thing that we're uh, are quite excited about uh, uh, having a more robust risk classifier where really uh, we're getting close to uh, uh, being able to uh, classify patients uh, at the time of diagnosis to one of the two uh, risk classes uh, without a need for a post-therapy uh, risk determination by flow. 
and some of the more uh, score based uh, you're probably familiar with the uh, uh, the um, uh, LSC 17 uh, that uh, folks from John Dix lab uh, had published a number of years ago uh, uh, we sh- uh, we really looked at it but uh, the LSC 17 although by itself was prognostic did not really add a whole lot to our uh, cytomolecular risk classification. Uh, ben Wong went back and really pulled the, uh, the you know, uh, data and uh, recreated a um, um, more optimized uh, um, um, LSC score, uh, he called LSC 47, uh, using 47 of the original 100 uh, uh, genes that uh, John Dick's group had pulled. Uh, and uh, this is a far more robust, uh, um, and it's been highly validated, uh, in multiple subsets uh, that goes beyond our uh, 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 risk, uh, our current cytomolecular risk classification. And this was just uh, published uh, in Nature Communication not too long ago. So this is uh, one that uh, uh, can be incorporated moving forward. The other one that this is Jason Ferrer, actually, that was uh, just accepted to JCO. This is using the link RNA uh, to uh, define uh, risk. And this is a signature was uh, uh, initially generated uh, by uh, uh, Jenny Smith uh, and uh, Jason uh, completed the work and uh, published it. And this is another really rather robust risk classifier that can be. And um, uh, Ben Wong through uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, grant mechanism through um, St. Ballers and ACS uh, is trying to actually combine these risk classifiers and try to come up with a single uh, uh, a risk determinant that really out for outperforms everything that we have so far. I think now he is the person to do it. So I'm, we're pretty excited about that. So overall, I'm hoping that um, you have an appreciation that uh, AML in children and young adults, uh, and I'm, by young adults, I'm taking all the way to age, you know, uh, 45, 50 or so. And uh, these are to have distinct biology compared to infants and older adults. Uh, uh, and um, uh, overall, the number of mutations are uh, not uh, particularly helpful, but uh, some of the fusions and structural events can be significant and really provides opportunity for uh, new therapeutic approaches. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about our approach to uh, the therapeutic development. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, I'll be referring to AML restricted targets, uh, which is basically these are non-hematopoietic uh, uh, genes and antigens uh, that are apparently expressed in AML. And um, uh, we uh, approached it in this manner because until now, all uh, therapeutic development has been uh, uh, against uh, targets in AML that are shared uh, with normal hematopoiesis and normal hematopoietic development. So um, not unexpectedly, you're going to have substantial uh, hematopoietic toxicity. So the um, concept is um, actually quite simple. This is uh, work that when we initially got our sequen- RNA sequencing data, so well, are there uh, uh, targets that are expressed um, in AML that are completely silent uh, in normal hematopoiesis? Right now, almost all of the answers that we talked about in AML, uh, targets overlap in normal hematopoiesis. Actually, in every possible way, even for diagnostic, that's why it's been so challenging to have uh, an MR, a flow-based MRD for AML, because virtually every uh, antibody that we use for AML, uh, that antibody cross-reacts with normal hematopoietic development. So that's one of the main challenges uh, has been. So the idea was that it can be identified a list of genes that are silent to normal hematopoiesis, but are expressed in, uh, in AML. And then uh, really, once you identify a list of genes that are silent, then interrogate the AML transcriptome uh, to see if uh, it's, it's expressed. Really, you know, it's a, it was a rather uh, simple question, and uh, but it required a large number of uh, cases for, re- uh, for evaluation. That's actually, that's why we uh, uh, um, put resources uh, into uh, uh, sequencing over 3,000 uh, um, uh, cases. Uh, so the optimum targets, as you can imagine, would be highly expressed in AML and would be expressed uh, in both silent or normal hematopoiesis to limit hematopoietic toxicity. And ideally, you want to have targets that are not expressed in other tissues uh, to limit on-target off-tumor effect. 
but uh, you can actually get around this uh, by, uh, you know, having sort of a logic gated uh, approach. Uh, so, but that's certainly possible. And then the, the other question is that, well, uh, cell surface versus intracellular targets, because the approach is going to be different. For cell surface, you can use uh, ADCs, CARs, bites, uh, things like that, whereas intracellular ones are the small molecules, uh, TCRs. Um, one thing that we'll talk about is actually um, using uh, what's called a TCR mimic antibodies uh, to uh, uh, go after intracellular targets. So the pipeline um, was actually um, um, was developed uh, by Jenny Smith uh, and uh, uh, really finally uh, uh, optimized by Ben Wong. And uh, starting with um, yeah, this is our, in, our initial about 1500 cases that we had, then we had uh, 84 uh, uh, normal marrow or CD34 positive cells. And uh, we, they went through this uh, really uh, very stringent computational process uh, trying to uh, uh, identify hematopo uh, hematopoietic uh, genes. Uh, and then uh, they bend them into either absent expression or low expression, and, and then trying to go after uh, identify you know, uh, uh, those genes in our AML. So, uh, and they, you know, they found some, some around like 14, 1200, 1400, uh, genes that are either si completely silent uh, uh, or uh, rather low expression in uh, normal hematopoiesis that were expressed in AML. So this process uh, then moved into, uh, once we identified those, uh, uh, whether the, they actually had some sort of a transmembrane domain motif that one can uh, stipulate that this would be a uh, cell surface versus uh, uh, intracellular one, if it's cell surface, uh, we went after val validation by flow uh, and moving it towards uh, preclinical development, either ADC, BITE, or CAR. And if there was a uh, uh, intracellular uh, after confirmation of the protein expression, then the idea was that uh, um, can you do it, go after the small molecule versus the TCR or TCR mimic? And this is uh, work that uh, uh, we initially uh, had uh, just farmed out to uh, our colleagues who were developing TCRs, but uh, uh, more recently, we've actually uh, uh, developed some uh, 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 preliminary data with TCR mimics that I will show you. So uh, we have a number of uh, uh, targets that are in clinical development right now. So mesothelin is one that I, you know, uh, we showed that to be highly expressed in uh, about 30, 40% of the patients, especially in KMT2A rearranged AML, uh, it's uh, induction of expression is uh, linked to hypomethylation of the uh, mesothelin uh, promoter region. Uh, uh, this is work that is already uh, published uh, uh, and um, uh, CAR-T is in uh, clinical development, is actually going through the clinical pipeline at Fred Hutch. Uh, it's in the, it's undergoing process development right now. So FOLAR1 and PRAIM are probably a more exciting targets. I will uh, spend some time uh, talking about both of these uh, uh, and where they are in clinical development, but those are probably uh, our most exciting and TSLPRs that uh, we, we have the car in hand and uh, we're uh, trying to decide whether or not to uh, move it in the clinical setting. And there are some, uh, we, have, we have a library of other targets that we're uh, uh, in the process of validating. So I want to focus on CBF GLIS uh, fusion. This is uh, uh, folks at the University of Minnesota are quite familiar because uh, uh, it seemed like there was a little mini epidemic uh, uh, a few years ago. And uh, uh, Robin Williams and Elaine Miller, uh, they had actually, uh, their, uh, their patients received uh, uh, an ADC uh, stro 2 uh, uh, for their patients. And um, um, so we'll, we'll show a little bit of that data, but CBF GLIS is a fusion that is uh, uniquely expressed in younger patients, uh, uh, and uh, they have dismal outcome. Uh, and uh, the computational pipeline to um, uh, specifically look for uh, AML restricted uh, antigens uh, in this group of uh, patients, uh, this probably has the highest number of genes uh, that are uh, uh, um, expressed that are not present in normal hematopoiesis. Uh, really quite uh, remarkable. This is the this is a slide that uh, um, Ben Wong generated. That we have some cell surface ones, and then uh, uh, 
uh, intracellular ones, the polar one is one that actually has absolutely no expression in normal hematopoiesis. Uh, that's actually uh, has rather uh, robust expression. This is the GTEx data that uh, showing that overall it has a very really low expression of other tissues. So um, when we look at the uh, transcript expression for C uh, of uh, uh, full R1 and RCBF plus AML, we can see that is this is about 1,400 patients that we're looking at. It is completely uh, absent in almost all patients, except those uh, few with uh, uh, with this uh, fusion, CBF plus fusion. And you can also see peripheral blood stem cell CD34 completely negative, bone marrow completely negative. We validated cell surface expression by flow, as you can see. It is rather robustly and uniformly expressed there. Um, one thing that we wanted to see if uh, expression of uh, for how tightly is expression of polar one uh, linked to uh, uh, this fusion. Uh, we took cord blood stem cells uh, 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 and transduced uh, with a CBF uh, GLIS fusion. Uh, we cultured them on EC co culture system uh, and uh, tested for uh, uh, presence of. Uh, CBF GLIS, uh, expression of full R1. And um, what we, uh, oops, and what we saw was that uh, uh, really a matter of, uh, you know, three to uh, six weeks, we started seeing expression of full R1. And by week 12 in, uh, in culture, uh, uh, almost all uh, of uh, uh, all cells uh, had converted to full R1 positive. It really showed causal link between the fusion and full R1 expression. And what's interesting is that uh, we tested these uh, cultured cells uh, uh, by RNA sequencing. And what was really uh, interesting was not only uh, that these cells uh, uh, phenotypically and immunophenotypically, they were virtually identical to the patient samples. Then uh, the expression of uh, uh, various genes uh, were uh, virtually identical to uh, patient samples. So it's really quite remarkable how closely uh, uh, we can recapitulate to human leukemia in culture with this, with this fusion. So this is a work that uh, Kui Li did in the lab. And uh, uh, so we basically created a, um, um, a CAR T using our standard backbone with different length uh, spacers. And what we um, showed uh, was uh, uh, that uh, we, saw, we saw really uh, quite potent uh, uh, cytotoxicity. Uh, and uh, what we saw was that seemed like the intermediate length spacer was our most ideal one. And this is our CAR-T uh, looking at the lysis of different uh, cell lines. This is our uh, engineered cell line. These are a couple of uh, WSU expresses uh, as uh, uh, the native expression of polar one. This is a CBF GLIS line, and this is our transduced Kasumi line, and this is the parental. So we really see a, a, a high sensitivity and, and uh, uh, cytotoxicity of our uh, polar one car. And this is our uh, uh, in vivo data um, um, that uh, 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 different uh, you know, our uh, engineer cell line and different cell lines that uh, we use. This is our CDX model, if you will. And uh, we really see really nice uh, uh, cytotoxicity uh, and uh, improved survival for patient uh, for uh, in these uh, mice. Um, and um, just uh, and we actually have um, uh, uh, so uh, PDX models uh, uh, that uh, really so this is our PDX uh, data. Um, we have much nicer figures now. We've, we've been able to uh, transduce with luciferase uh, or primary samples. But anyway, as you can see, even our PDX models, we have beautiful cytotoxicity. Um, uh, regarding uh, 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 hematopoietoxicity, hematopoietox toxicity, we basically did an experiment where we um, uh, added our uh, car to. Uh, various fractions uh, from uh, uh, of CD34 positive, and we see absolutely no hematopoietic toxicity whatsoever uh, uh, with our uh, CAR T, uh, as uh, as expected, because there is no full R1 expression uh, in normal hematopoiesis. 
And we also did a um, tissue microarray study uh, looking for uh, if there's any expression. There is uh, some expression in uh, uh, in uh, kidneys, but overall, it's actually there's not very much uh, polar one uh, that's been identified. And uh, that's exactly what we see that there's overall and all the ADCs and uh, bites are already developed for ovarian cancer. There's a very little cytotox little toxicity that is seen. So right now, our Fred Hodge Fuller 1 CAR T is in an advanced stage of clinical development. Uh, uh, the vector is uh, undergoing process development engineering. Uh, we have protocol in hand. The, the IND is uh, anticipated to be in July of 2023 with anticipated uh, uh, activation in September. Of, uh, this is a very aggressive uh, timeline that's entirely funded uh, by uh, philanthropy through a project called Project Stella. And uh, this is uh, our... In, our, uh, one of our first patients. And then there's another uh, patient, um, Ella, that uh, uh, these two families really banded together and supported because as you can imagine, there is uh, virtually no interest from um, pharma or any other organization because it's such a rare disorder. But one thing I can tell you is that the CAR T is highly effective in osteosarcoma that expresses full R1. So we have a, uh, right now we're moving that uh, um, uh, uh, process forward, and we have a clinical trial that's under development. So, as a possibility of uh, uh, a clinical trial on osteosarcoma. So, um, a, a couple of things that's interesting is that while we were developing our CAR T, there are two companies that were developing uh, uh, ADCs, uh, Stro002, uh, the Sutro company, and Elucida had an ELUO01. And I'll quickly sort of share some of that data. Uh, this is the data of, uh, with straw 2 as you can see that um, drug is highly potent and effective both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, these are two different uh, doses that we're seeing completely eliminating uh, uh, leukemia in our uh, uh, model system. And uh, because of based on this data, the company uh, allowed compassion to use access uh, to the drug. And we're seeing remarkable efficacy with absolutely no hematopoietic toxicity. And uh, we, right now, as of now, we have about 23, 24 patients uh, treated. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lane and Robin's uh, patients were our very first two patients um, who had relapsed 21 days and 28 days post-transplant. And uh, some of the patients who had earlier uh, um, uh, disease progressions have really fared remarkably well. This is our local patient uh, who was uh, completely refractory to uh, induction chemotherapy. And after two courses of chemotherapy had 95% uh, uh, blast. After three doses every other week, a patient went from 95% uh, blast to MRD negative disease, single agent stro 2 And this is in the face of rising ANC. So at the time she became MRD negative, uh, ANC was 2170. And uh, we have another uh, patient that uh, shows similar uh, uh, results. And we've been able to deliver this drug as single agent post-transplant uh, uh, with uh, no uh, impact on uh, uh, count. So we're really, uh, this uh, so company is actually uh, very aggressively moving this into clinical trial stage uh, at this uh, time while continuing to deliver the drug on compassionate use basis until trial is open. Uh, Elucida, very similarly, we saw high potency uh, of their drug, and um, we're seeing at the 0.5 milligram per kilogram, uh, we're really seeing complete eradication of the disease. And this actually, uh, as of uh, last week, they uh, uh, got clearance by the FDA to activate the drug and we, uh, the, the trial, and we anticipate the trial to be open uh, uh, really in, in, in the next uh, couple of three weeks. Uh, so I think that uh, this is another, this is quite exciting that, that this drug will be available uh, through a clinical trial as well. So, um, um, so I'm going to, in the last uh, um, few minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about our work with the uh, PRAME, the TCR Mimic CAR-T. Um, as uh, you may know, uh, PRAME uh, stands for Preferential Expression Antigen Melanoma, so it's not an AML target uh, by nature. It is overexpressed in multiple cancers, melanoma being the top one. We see it expressed in neuroblastoma uh, and uh, also in AML. It's an intracellular antigen. Uh, it is expressed, in, uh, but it is expressed, is processed 
uh, and presented on the cell surface through the MHC molecule. So, uh, 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 so that's basically the idea of can you target this uh, uh, by making an antibody that recognizes the prime peptide uh, in the context of uh, uh, HLA. Uh, so uh, this is simply shows the expression of uh, PREM in AML. Um, as you can see um, in the bottom, it is uh, expressed in more than half of the KMT2 rearranged uh, ones. Almost all A21s express it. And uh, so um, uh, a company called Eureka, uh, almost 20 years ago, they had uh, uh, generated an antibody called uh, PR20 uh, in collaboration with uh, David Scheinberg. And um, they had done some studies with it that they did not uh, feel that it was uh, really doing much. So they actually abandoned uh, uh, this antibody. This started as a purely an academic exercise uh, for uh, uh, one of our um, uh, uh, graduate students. Uh, and this was picked up by Daniel Kirky in the lab uh, more recently. And uh, we've, uh, it's really, uh, uh, it is quite remarkable uh, 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 what one can do as someone uh, in my lab called the dumpster diving. Uh, uh, so uh, what we show is that uh, in, the con in the context of HLA-A2 that this was designed for, we're able to identify uh, um, uh, expression of uh, PREM on the cell surface. And this actually highly specific that we did all kinds of uh, uh, prime positive, prime negative HLA2, A2 positive, uh, prime positive HLA2 negative. And the bottom line is that we're able to, uh, uh, the, the expression is highly specific and we can uh, target it with PR20 quite effectively. So once we were able to show that we can pick it up on the cell surface, the uh, OCI AML2, and it was actually, I was surprised how bright the signal was. I expected uh, this to be rather dim because there are not gonna be very many, uh, many molecules, but it's actually, it's impressive how bright this can be. Um, we were able to show this by flow on the cell surface. It can see rather homogeneous expression, of all leukemic uh, blasts. Um, and um, so we actually took um, the, this uh, PR20 sequence and uh, created a CAR uh, T with it. And um, we, we saw the really rather potent, this is incredibly potent that we see at the one to one mix, uh, that we see nearly 100% cell kill. Uh, uh, with THP1 and uh, similarly highly potent in OCI. So the, we picked a short uh, linker uh, to move uh, move it forward. And what we are seeing is that we, we see really uh, very nice cytotoxicity uh, uh, and um, uh, with our uh, uh, car construct. Um, so um, uh, really, really you know, this is a cytokine uh, uh, production that we're seeing really quite a, a remarkable activation and uh, cytotoxicity uh, that we're seeing and also quite specific uh, that uh, uh, when we look for, uh, uh, you know, HLA, uh, prime positive HLA to negative, uh, we, we do not see any cell kill. And uh, one thing that was uh, sort of uh, known is that the interfering gamma can actually upregulate the HLA A2 and as a result, Imp would improve cytotoxicity uh, of uh, uh, TCRs and TCR mimics. And that's exactly what we see, that by simply you know, um, having interfering gamma, we're able to uh, uh, substantially improve uh, cytotoxicity. And this is something that's already been used in uh, uh, various clinical trials as part of, the, part of the optimizing TCR. So we think that you know, if and when this uh, gets into clinic, uh, the uh, response can be optimized uh, by uh, interfering gamma treatments. Uh, so this is uh, the data uh, from our uh, cell line uh, that uh, OCI, THP1, and K562, uh, this is our uh, sort of negative control and positive controls. As you can see that uh, this CAR T is quite effective. Uh, and one, I can tell you that uh, Dave Schomburg Group has brought it up to uh, brought the, uh, the this development of their uh, they had created a bite with it to this stage. They were not able to take it any further with patient samples. So the challenge for us was uh, to show that if there is efficacy 
in uh, PDX models and uh, uh, patient samples. We did show the cytotoxicity in patient samples that was really quite remarkable. And this is a recent data that Daniel Kirky has generated uh, uh, with, uh, with our PDX model. You know, we actually were able to uh, call luciferize uh, primary patient samples and cre create a PDX. And as you can see, uh, our uh, TCR mimic CAR, uh, Prime CAR T, uh, it really eliminated, it completely cleared the disease, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, after a single dose. And, uh, you know, we're pushing uh, day 150 right now, and there's absolutely no evidence of disease. So based on this data, and we had a, a communication, uh, uh, we had a meeting with uh, uh, Eureka, and there's, a, uh, we're actually now moving our uh, prime car team to clinical arena, uh, it, it, uh, almost 15, 20 years after the antibody was generated and was uh, abandoned. So we're quite excited about this. And the other thing is that this is uh, a target that is uh, very highly expressed in almost all neuroblastoma. So we're actually testing, uh, uh, creating a neuroblastoma model for testing as well. So um, overall, uh, we think that, you know, PRIME is really an outstanding uh, target. There is a, uh, the limitation is that uh, uh, this particular antibody only recognizes a PRIME in the context of HLA-A2. We have some ongoing work uh, with our co uh, collaborators in uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh trying to go after uh, just the peptide itself. There's a, a uh, some work with nanobodies, uh, some uh, more of a peptide-centric uh, uh, work that we're trying to move forward with, uh, uh, trying to optimize uh, this process. So I'll summarize, like, you know, I, I'm hoping that uh, uh, I've been able to convince you that AML uh, in younger patients is quite distinct. Uh, uh, our new findings is really helping us understand the disease a whole lot better. Uh, 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 and um, really, we're, uh, we have new prognostic variants that we're trying to move forward. But I'm most excited about the really simple idea of non-hematopoietic antigens uh, that are apparently expressed in AML and how they can be used. They can certainly be, we're using them, you know, we're creating MRD panels because if it's not expressed in normal hematopoiesis, then it's, it's an easy target uh, to uh, use for uh, MRD monitoring. And, but more importantly, for the new therapies is something that, you know, I've never been this optimistic, uh, 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 you know, about, you know, what uh, the potential for treating AML uh, is. So I'm going to stop there. This is the folks uh, uh, who've uh, been doing the work uh, that arrow shows uh, where the uh, lab is, and I can tell you that uh, Mountain is photoshopped because uh, that is not where Mount Rainier is. So, <laughs> anyway, so um, I'll, I'm looks. I, I left a few, few minutes for uh, questions, if there are any. Okay, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand, and I will call them. Oh, Amy Beckman, go ahead. I, I just have a I have a quick question. I'm one of the hematopo, um, hematopathologists here, and I am so excited by your talk and your idea of using non-hematopoietic antigens as targets, um, especially for kids because these are particularly sad cases when we see them. I I'm really interested in the STRO trials, which I think we've had a couple of patients on those trials now. Are you optimistic that there are that there will be a good number of targets, potential targets out there that it seems like the GLIS2 rearranged um, cases are kind of a special case. Do you think there are going to be many of these potential targets that will be useful for people with AML? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Uh, the the list uh, the list is about fourteen hundred genes uh, that uh, meet the criteria, and for example, mesothelin is one. Mesothelin has no business being expressed in AML, but we have about thirty percent of the patients. Actually, that's a trial that's under development right now. We already have the vector in hand, so uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, we have Prime, uh, we have actually TSLPR, uh, we have actually five other ones that are in advanced stages. So there's actually quite a number of these. I mean, because really AML is disease of abnormal expression of genes. And uh, so we've been focusing on, you know, easy ones are the ones that we know about, 33s and 123s, but that's actually 
those are not the targets to really go after. So we have basically, we have 1,400 genes that we're trying to prioritize. Uh, and um, uh, we have probably, ten, we're trying to say, okay, uh, which ones overlap uh, uh, AML cases. There are actually 10 to 12 of them. If we stack them, they'll cover the entire uh, uh, AML. And we, we probably have about five, uh, uh, five of these uh, targets just for KMT to a rearrange uh, AML. So yeah, there's a number of them. That, that's really great news. Well, thanks again for your talk. It, it was a really interesting talk. I very much appreciate it. Any other questions? Yeah, this is Betsy. Um, so, so Hela, you know, we're kind of privileged being part of COG and seeing all of this. We have a certain number of patients that come here that don't go on study. Mm -hmm. And um, I think many other institutions do too, although the, the vast majority do go on study. And I guess one question is, how do you really get the information out uh, about what should be done at diagnosis. What should you be ruling out? You know, the, the patients who are enrolled on study get a lot of testing done um, and it's all integrated and the physicians get that back. But there seems like there should be some responsibility of the field in general to somehow get recommendations out for initial diagnosis. Um, I'm just wondering what what you think, and everybody has different panels and different sequencing and different fish and different whatever. Yeah, it's actually become, about that. Yeah, it's actually become a lot more complicated because you, we used to say, oh, to make sure that your kids, uh, you know, uh, leukemia sequence, but now people sequence, but they, they just do so, you know, panel of uh, 10 DNA, they do DNA sequencing, not RNA sequencing. I think that the part of it, it is part of education. We've used um, COG trial as a sort of a standard uh, for what uh, uh, all patients should uh, receive, uh, because the idea is that well, there should not uh, you should not treat uh, one patient differently than the other based on whether they enroll on a trial or not, uh, because it's really you know it's not a study question, uh, you know uh, the sequencing. It's a matter of you're using. Uh, one thing that actually we've uh, worked uh, on is actually enhancing our uh, parent advocacy group, something that we really not, we have not used our parent advocates appropriately. We, even when they come to us, they go raise money and just give it to us uh, and stay you know, out of our way. And I think that the, the, we can actually use parent advocates in a, in a very, very powerful way, uh, both disseminating information, especially in this day and age of, uh, uh, as well as, you know, for, you know, making sure that the, they're, you know, the advocate for our kids, like, you know, send my kids, uh, you know, sample for sequencing and now uh, for these studies. Um, but also uh, really educating uh, uh, the COG mechanism. Uh, nice thing is that everyone is part of COG. Uh, you know, uh, I don't. I don't think I know a pediatric institution that is not. So just basically, you know, having a, um, you know, doing a better job with our education process. Uh, and but I think that integrating our family advocates into the mix is going to be critical. And you know, that's something that we have been uh, uh, you know, doing, and we just need to do a better job at it. Yeah, that's a good, a, a, a great suggestion. Um, I also, I was wondering about the possibility of genetic counselors becoming involved. We have many genetic counselors these days who work almost as genomic analysts. Um, they're certainly involved in counseling when you get to anything that's heritable um, or a germline variant that's predisposing. But would it be a place, um, because they have the genetic background, um, to start developing some kind of specialty where they actually work with the families, they are trained in counseling as well as in the genetics. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you know, that might be something also that one might think of moving forward. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I, I think unfortunately right now, genetic counselors uh, are uh, more of a, you know, at least in our institution is more of a, uh, we have to uh, consult them. So if they're not automatically involved in every case, some say, oh, well, you know, let's, uh, you know, have uh, them involved for this patient because uh, there's a strong family history or some other reason. But I think that you're right. I think, you know, they, they probably should be involved that, you know, uh, in every case, uh, you know, um, so I think that that's, that's a really not, nice suggestion. That's something that, you know, uh, 
uh, if they can be functionalized, uh, you know, it's going to be very helpful. The question is, how do you get it across from, uh, you know, across institutions? Okay, Betsy, would you like to close for the day? Uh, oops. I want to thank everybody for attending and thank uh, Dr. Mishinchi for uh, giving a great talk, an exciting talk. We'll have you back and you can show us the change in the uh, in the slope of those curves for pediatric AML. I do think it's a really exciting um, era and very happy that you're working on it. Well, I, thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and, and thank you so much and uh, uh, hope to see you soon, Betsy. Thank you.